Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Matt Munger, and this is The Bible Was Written Backwards. We've been looking at different ideas of creation from the ancient Near East and the Bible, and showing how the Bible is looking backward at these traditions, images, ideas, texts that we find there. Today we're going to continue this with one final piece of this puzzle by looking at the images of the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life in Genesis and see what the Bible might be looking backward towards in these cases. In Genesis, the Garden of Eden is the place where man is placed after his creation. The main text that introduces the scene is this one, Genesis 2, 8-9. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord made grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A lot of these pictures and images belong to the world of the ancient Near East. So I want to look backwards at some of these things that might have been in the imagination of the authors when they created this Garden of Eden text in Genesis. I want to start by looking at something that's not a garden, but just the idea of where the gods lived before people populated the earth. And some of the oldest images we have are from the Sumerian texts that imagine this as a city, not necessarily as a garden. So we'll get to the garden here in a minute. So there's a number of descriptions of primeval homes of gods uh, in the Sumerian and Akkadian texts. And one of these that's long been connected to the understanding of the earliest abode of the, of the gods is a city called Dilmun, which we find in the Enki and Ninhursag story. What we want to discuss here is the first part of the story that we left out in the, in the last video. The city of Dilmun is described as a place where the gods live and where basically everything is peaceful. So look at the description here. That place is clean. That place is bright. In Dilmun, the raven utters no cries. The Itidu bird utters not the cry of the Itidu bird. The lion kills not. The wolf snatches not the lamb. The sick-eyed says not, I am sick-eyed. The sick-headed says not, I am sick-headed. The old woman says not, I am an old woman. And the old man says not, I am an old man. Scholars aren't 100% in agreement on how to interpret this text. Earlier, scholars working with this saw this as a depiction of paradise. So there is no sick sickness, there is no death, there is no fighting between the different animals, and this actually is very similar to a description of things that we're going to look at in some of the prophetic texts in, in another video. So scholars aren't in agreement about whether or not this actually describes paradise. The description of the animals being peaceful together and humans not being sick or not becoming old seems to suggest something that is better or beyond what we have on Earth. But at the same time, this city has a major problem. It's lacking water. So Ninsikila, uh, who is Anki's daughter, the god Anki's daughter, asks for water to be given to the great city of Dilmun. And Anki responds by granting this wish and having the god Utu, the, the sun god, bring forth fresh water from under the earth. From the mouth whence issues the waters of the earth brought her sweet water from the earth. He brings up the water into her city. So this is, of course, reminiscent of the situation of the Garden of Eden, which is described as being at the confluence or the start or at the intersection or the beginning of the four great rivers in Genesis 2. It says that a river flows out of Eden to water the gardens, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The idea that the first abode of the gods was a city is also found in other Sumerian texts, and one of them is the composition that's called Anlil and Ninlil. This text describes the home of the gods as sometime before the creation of humans, and in this case it is the city of Nippur that is described. The story of Enlil and Ninlil uh, begins by naming the city where the gods lived in the beginning. There was a city. There was a city. The one we live in. Nippur was the city. The one we live in. Enlil was one of its young men, and Nin uh, Ninlil was one of its young women. Nunbar Chegunu was one of its wise old women. And these are the three main characters that show up in the rest of the story, which has to do with Enlil trying to seduce Ninlil. So again, we're back to the, the actions of the gods. 
But the descriptions of, the, of a city at the beginning of time shows how people placed the gods within relatable social structures. So the description of Dilmun is probably based on an actual place, or at least the idea of an actual place. And though, of course, we don't imagine that the gods lived there, it is people thinking back to how the origins of their city came about. The same is certainly the case with Nippur. The idea of Nippur as a pre-existing city inhabited by the gods, which later becomes inhabited by people, presents a mythological origin to the city which was in existence. And the tablets describing this were found in that city. Now, other texts in the sumero akkadian world use not a city, but the steppe or the wild or a garden as their image of where the gods hang out before humans come along. So we will turn to some of these other texts, well, one of these other texts, the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh is often described as one of the greatest literary works of the ancient world. It was most likely composed sometime in the mid-2nd millennium BCE, so between maybe 1600 and 1200 BCE, but it was definitely based on older traditions, and we have texts about Gilgamesh being found far back into the 3rd millennium BCE. These were widely in circulation, and the story of Gilgamesh was found in multiple tablets in multiple places throughout the ancient Near East. Now, the story of Gilgamesh is the tale of King Gilgamesh of Uruk, who was two-thirds divine and one-third man. Don't ask me how that works, but okay. Gilgamesh is described as a wild ox of a king and being an untamed man. And so the gods create a true wild man, Enkidu, as a companion for him. Gilgamesh and Enkidu get into lots of trouble and mischief together, which culminates in them fighting with the gods. The goddess Ishtar is the main opponent in this scene, and she gets the permission to send the bull of heaven to attack Gilgamesh and Enkidu. And Gilgamesh and Enkidu win the battle and kill the bull of heaven. And this enrages the gods who punish the two, deciding that one of them must die. And this one is Enkidu. So Enkidu becomes sick and he dies. And the text kind of makes it clear that the punishment is just as much for Gilgamesh as it is for Enkidu. Because Gilgamesh grieves and then goes on a quest to find a source of immortality because he's so grieved by the loss of his friend. So we read, For his friend Enkidu, Gilgamesh was weeping bitterly as he roamed the wild. I shall die, and shall I not be like Enkidu? Sorrow has entered my heart. I became afraid of death, so go roaming the wild. To Uta Napishti, the son of Ubartutu. So Gilgamesh travels to the ends of the earth in search of Uta Napishti, the survivor of the great flood who was given eternal life by the gods after his ordeal. We're going to be talking more about Utan Napishti and the other flood heroes in a couple weeks, but it is from here on out that we have parts of Gilgamesh that are most interesting to the, to the idea we're working with today. So Gilgesh, Gilgamesh makes his way to the edge of a great garden of jewels, which is the home of the gods and the eternal home of Utan Napishti. It is described like this in the text. Upon seeing the trees of the gods, he went straight up to them. A carnelian tree was in fruit, hung with bunches of grapes, lovely to behold. A lapis lazuli tree bore foliage, in full fruit and gorgeous to gaze on. So, arriving at the place where he's going to find the hero of the flood and the possessor of the knowledge of how a human can attain, uh, attain eternal life, which is also the home of the gods, Gilgamesh enters a a garden of, of jeweled trees. Now, there are a number of interactions in the garden, and among them is Utanapishtim telling the flood story, telling exactly what he went through. But what is most interesting here is that Utanapishtim tells Gilgamesh about a plant, which will give him eternal life. And the scene where this is told looks like this. You came here, Gilgamesh, toiled, exerted yourself. And what have I given you as you go back to your land? I will disclose, Gilgamesh, a secret matter. I will tell you a mystery of the gods. It is a plant, its appearance like a box thorn. Its thorns like a dog roses, it will prick your hands. If you can gain possession of the plant, 
the text breaks off here. But because of the parallels in other tablets and later parts of this text, we know that what the plant is, is that it gives life. The plant that gives life is one of the key points of the Gilgamesh epic. Gilgamesh's search for immortality leads him to the very ends of the earth, the garden of the gods, and the confrontation with the only person who could possibly give him advice on his quest for eternal life, the one who survived the flood and was granted immortality. So upon learning about this plant, Gilgamesh does not hesitate. When Gilgamesh heard this, he opened a channel, heavy stones he tied to his feet, and they dragged him down to the Apsu. He, he took the plant, he pulled it up, he cut loose the heavy stones from his feet, and the sea cast him upon its shore. Now, the, the plant is at the bottom of a very deep pond, or maybe down to the deep of Apsu. And Gilgamesh uses a creative technique to reach the bottom of the pond. He ties stones to his feet so he gets pulled down, and he grabs the plant. His goal is to return as quickly as he can to Uruk with his new prize. And so he boards a, a ship or a boat captained by Urshanabi, and they set off. Gilgamesh spoke to him, to Urshanabi, the boatman. Urshanabi, this plant is the plant of heartbeat, by which means a man can recapture his vitality. I will take it to Uruk, the sheepfold. I will feed some to an old man and put the plant to a test. Its name will be The Old Man Has Grown Up. I will eat some myself, and I will go back to how I was in my youth. On the way home to Uruk, they make a stop where Gilgamesh makes a fateful decision. After 20 leagues, they broke bread, and after 30 leagues, they pitched camp. Gilgamesh found a pool whose water was cool, and he went into it to take a bath in the water. A snake smelled the fragrance of the plant, Silently, it came up and bore the plant off. As it turned away, it sloughed the skin. The Bil Gilgamesh sat down weeping, the tears streaming down the side of his face. Those of you who know the text of Genesis 2 and 3 will immediately recognize some thematic parallels here. First of all, what we see here is the loss of access to the plant of life. In the Gilgamesh epic, the cause of the loss of access to immortality is not presented as moral failure, or a bad decision, but rather as an unfortunate event. Gilgamesh went for a swim, and the snake came and took it. But the point is still clear. Despite even the most heroic actions, humans simply cannot attain and keep the one thing that truly separates them from the gods, eternal life. The Genesis story has the same basic point. We're moving from a pristine world to the world of humans, which we all know is not perfect. Humans die, work is hard, Sometimes life sucks. But why do we die? Well, first of all, because we're not gods. That's the major point. We are not gods, and gods are the ones that live eternally. Second of all, we die because we don't have access to the tree or plant that might give us eternal life. Now, two details in the story are worth mentioning. First is the function of the plant. In Gilgamesh, we see that it will allow one to regain their life force. And the, the word that's used here is napishtim, which is cognate with nefesh, the Hebrew word that's used in Genesis 2 to describe the composite human after God breathes life into the man. So the result of eating the plant is the return of this vitality, the vital part of oneself that is gone in death. The second detail is the identity of one of the one who messes up the human possibility for attaining immortality, a snake. The presence of the serpent in both texts is striking. In, G in the Genesis text, the snake approaches the woman, suggesting that it would be okay to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God had prohibited in Genesis 2.17. The result of the first humans choosing to listen to the serpent and eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that they are banished from the Garden of Eden and no longer given access to the Tree of Life. And then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might reach out his hand and also take from the Tree of Life and eat and live forever. And therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground which, from which he was taken. In Gilgamesh, the serpent has a less devious description, simply sliding out of the water grabbing the plant and returning. 
The result, however, is precisely the same. The plant is taken away to a place inaccessible to humans, never to be accessed again. So the overarching themes are very clear here. People die, but we want to know why they can't just live forever. Shouldn't we be able to find a way? And the answer is no, we simply can't live forever. We could have, in some long and lost time, there was a tree or a plant which could have given us this eternal life, but it is no longer accessible to us because of a serpent.